So um, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's great to be back in London, or when a man tires of IEA in London, he is tired of life, with apologies to Boswell and uh, Johnson. Um, I'm going to begin with a little story, just a short story to make a very important point. Um, you all know the story of Robin Hood, who robbed from the rich and gave to the poor. But those rich were crony capitalists who, with the sheriff of Nottingham, basically stole the ordinary people's money. But he had a twin brother, and most people don't know the story about Robert Hood. So Robert Hood lived in the small little village and had ambitions to be a mayor. And uh, so he was wondering, how can he buy enough votes to oust the mayor and become the new mayor? And he heard the story about this rich businessman who lived out in the countryside. And once a year, he would come to town with money to buy a lot of things, and then he would go back to business. Um, and so um, our friend Robert lay in waiting for him. Uh, the merchant came by with his pack horse full of money, and Robert robbed him and uh, took all the money, went to town, and he said, listen, you people, if you elect me mayor, I'm going to give each of you so many pieces of gold and silver. And lo and behold, he won. And the gold and silver was really a lot. It was enough for most of the farmers to stop farming and most of the handicraftsmen to stop engaging in handicraftsmen and most of the traders to close down. So the next year again, he lay in wait and just on schedule, here comes the merchant again. And as usual, he robs him again. And he goes back to town, passes out the money and says, I deserve re-election, don't you think? And they said, yes, unanimous. Worked out terrific. By this time, all the farmers stopped farming. The fields were fallow. All the handicraftsmen stopped handicrafting and all the merchants stopped merchanting. So the next year he goes back out and he lays in wait and in comes the merchants and he holds him up. But the merchant doesn't have any money. And he says, where's your money? He says, well, you know, you were taxing me at 100%. So I decided I was going to stop bringing in any money. So he goes back to town, and the uh, citizens are waiting. Where's our money? He says, we don't have any. So not only did they throw him out of office, but all the farmers starved, and all the merchants starved, and all the handicraftsmen starved, and the entire village was destitute for about two or three years. Now, what's the moral of the story? There's a question of who you impose the tax on, but who bears the tax burden. The point of collection was the merchant, but the actual victims in suffering were the people. So you all these need to think long and clear about when everybody sums, we're going to tax the rich, we're going to tax the business, we're going to tax yacht makers, we're going to tax plane makers, we're going to tax owners of property. You might find out that there's unemployment among the plane makers, the boat makers, the construction people who build property, and the wages are fall, the unemployment will rise. And so you just need to be a little bit careful when thinking about all of this. So, okay, off we're going to go here on this race through a little bit of history and facts and data. And um, I don't expect you to memorize it all, but, um, and there's no multiple choice true-false test when we're done, but I am going to... Um, do this, thank you. But I am going to, uh, so let's start out here, if we may, with a little bit of a, of a, of a thing here. Um, none of this makes any sense, that's why we uh, call it the tax code. Um, but this is not as good as, this is my absolute favorite cartoon of all. And so here's our friend Albert Einstein, who can't make head nor tails of the, uh, of the tax code. So um, I, I don't know how many pages the British tax code is, but I'm going to show you later a slide which is going to take the American tax code from 100 pages to 77,000, and you'll see this relentless march of the growth of administrative uh, things. Now, if you take a look here, it turns out that until really into the 20th century, and a good way into the 20th century, we thought of government as a rather limited enterprise. What does it do? Well, it provided some public utility services. The main ones were defense, law and order, and infrastructure. There was a limited amount of regulation. It wasn't heavy-handed. We also had standards of weights and measures. And of course, the uh, Newton's um, assay of 1704 gave standard values to coins of all over the world and facilitated trade. And um, we do pounds and feet, and you do whatever you do. And Europe did whatever it did. But you have standards. You can conduct business, useful kinds of things. And then, of course, um, we had money, which had a standard, too and um, gold standards some countries, and uh, silver standard other countries, and bimetallic standards. But by and large, money was pretty much well and clearly defined until we got rid of these metallic standards. 
Now, if you think about the um, change, look at what's happened really in the last 70 to 80 years. We have grown from this limited government to this all-encompassing government. In some places they call it the nanny state. In others it's the take care of your state. In the uh, United States a few years ago before the last presidential election they created this cartoon called Julia. She was a cartoon figure and it showed from the day she was born till the day she died the government could take care of everything for her that she ever wanted or needed. And it implied she never had to do a day's work or earn a penny in her whole life. So if you look down here, what you see is just the enormous growth in the activities of government. And through most of history, it was much less. Now it's become much more. To give you a statistical example from the United States, when Richard Nixon took office, and that was about 50 years ago, we had 20 alphabet soup agencies agencies like um, Civil Aviation Board or the Highway Transportation Safety Board. When Nixon left office after eight years, we had 50 agencies. So we've had an explosion in the growth of regulatory agencies. And these have also taken place at the state and local government level. So now we have hundreds and hundreds of regulatory agencies that micromanage every aspect of your life in the executive branch of our government. And I took a look once on the uh, British websites. And if you go down the number of bodies that are called regulatory agencies, they go page after page after page after page. And they intrude to every aspect of your life from not just changing a window pane to whether you can wash your window pane on Wednesday morning. No, the last part they don't do. But just to give you some indication. Now, I also want to give you um, some sense of what's happened here. And I want to do some comparison numbers with the United Kingdom. Um, and what you can see here is that it's been pretty steady with some ups and downs government spending. It's got as high as 50%, 47 it's come up and down. But you don't see anything like you may have seen, say, for example, in 1850, where it was 10%. In the United States, for example, as recently as 1929, combined federal and state and local government spending was 10% of GNP, 10%. It didn't really ratchet up till World War II. It was higher during World War I, but it came down. And the same thing you would see if you looked through British history in the 19th century. The uh, British government was on the order of no more than 10% of national income. At the same time, it virtually paid off the entire country's national debt. Now I've got to get this green again. This thing is not cooperating. There we go. So this shows you spending and revenues running from 1900 up to the year, oh, about 2008 or 2010. And what you can see, of course, clearly is World War I. And you can clearly see World War II. And that becomes the big areas of dramatic spending. But then what happened is after it comes down from World War II, it doesn't go back to pre-World War I levels. You've built in a rather permanent uh, a spending and taxing requirement to sustain what Lord Beveridge wanted to bring about, which was a kind of socialist welfare state. Now, if we look at this one here, you can really get a much better sense of what UK spending and taxation looked like. If you look at tax revenue, it's held reasonably constant in the 40% range. But now look at spending here. You had a marked fall off from 92 to 2000, really substantial. And then it just roars straight up, just straight up, unchecked, unbounded. It's just uh, let's spend it while the good days are here. And then, of course, came the financial crisis and the spending went down. But if you look at the gap from the period, say, oh, 2008 on up, you see this huge, widened opening where the borrowing is just enormous. And so what happened in that particular period is that Britain just dug itself into this huge debt hole. So not only did it keep its high tax burden, it also substantially increased its uh, debt while at the same time ran up public spending. So um, the next time somebody tells you they don't believe in the growth of government, you should uh, use the phrase, I'm from Missouri, the show me state. I want to I see that. Now, 
Let's take a look and hop across the ocean here. And so this runs from uh, the end of World War II, and we run it up to about 2012. And here um, uh, you can also see, if you notice, the run-up of the Korean War, and then it goes down. And then it's pretty steady going on, going on, going, going, going up until we have a substantial fall. And the interesting thing about that is the falls under William Jefferson Clinton. Actually, the best performance of the American economy did not occur under Reagan, did not occur under George W. Bush, 41. It occurred under William Jefferson Clinton. Now, it helped a lot that in 1994, Newt Gingrich took over the Congress, and they kind of agreed to do a whole bunch of things, like have some welfare reform, um, like curtail spending. Turns out that if you were to be that proverbial visitor from Mars, you would actually think that William Jefferson Clinton, or Bill Clinton, was a very moderate center-right president when it came to economic policy. Um, stock market tripled during those periods. Everything went pretty well. And as we say, George Bush squandered the surplus on a massive attempt to spread democracy in countries that didn't have any history of it for uh, 5,000 years. So needless to say, it didn't work very well. Now, um, let me go on to the next one here. So this gives you an indication also of spending and, and uh, revenue in the United States. It's also quite similar to what you have in, in Britain here. And you can see how that deficit exploded because of the financial crisis. Um, I'm not going to get into it. I just wanted to, to get a sense of these pictures when you think uh, about it. Now, the next slide is one where I think you really want to register this number very clearly. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, this was total government. As you see, if you go very back to about 1910 or so, it's about 8% of the economy. And then, of course, it explodes in World War I, but only a very modest 30%. And then World War II, it explodes over 50%. And then after the war, it crashes down. And then it goes up and down, uh, but settles in at about the 30-35% range. Um, in 1929, it turned out state and local spending was twice that of the federal government. Now federal spending is roughly uh, double that of state and local government. So in the last 50 years, we've had this huge, huge shift away from the 50 states into Washington so that money and power become increasingly centralized. This is the most fascinating chart to look at who pays taxes. If you look at the share of income taxes paid by the top 1%, the top 1%, they don't pay enough, do they? They pay 40% of all income tax. Top 1% pay 40% of all income tax. That's not fair. Shouldn't they pay 50, 60, 70, 80? The other 99% pay 60%. That's way too much. I mean, where does this argument go? And um, I'm trying to caricature this because, of course, we're told that the rich should pay 75% in the case of France, which they're going to let expire because the French ran away and don't pay it, and it's a disaster. And Depardieu, my favorite Frenchman, went off to Russia to pay 13% tax. And Brigitte Bardot also became a Russian national to pay 13% instead of 75%. And then, of course, there are so many French people in London that there are neighborhoods where you couldn't find a croissant to three on every corner block. And uh, they didn't come here because they love 75% marginal tax rates. So in some sense, when you look at all this, what you see is a pattern of declining tax rates, which led to a booming economy, and rising tax rates paid by the top 1%. So in the United States, the bottom half pays zero. Zero. 50% of the population pays zero. I worry because 51% might vote to take the money away from the other 49%. Okay, now we have to go to talking about income tax and why the flat tax. And there we go. So there's basically, if you think about it from an economic standpoint, four criteria. Um, the first one is fairness. Now, um, social justice has become a fashionable term. Everybody wants social justice global justice, social justice, local justice. Um, and I hope somebody can tell me what that means before you all leave for home, because I have the foggiest idea. I think it means whatever the majority thinks it can extract out of the rest of the population when it comes time to elections, legislation, and uh, taxes. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot, a lot about that, but all the way up really to uh, the 20th century, we have this concept called horizontal equity. 
equals should be taxed equally. Okay, sort of like everybody pays a tithe or everybody pays in proportion to their income. And then we came up with this concept in the 1930s called vertical equity and we threw away centuries of tax philosophy in which we said if you make 10 times as much it's not fair only to pay 10 times as much in taxes, you should pay 20 times as much or 30 times as much or 40 times as much. So in the United States it got up to 91% and here in Britain it got to 102%. Literally, they took 102% of your income in taxes in certain tax brackets. And the streets were flooded with Rolls Royces. And how could that be? They were all company cars. You may as well take your compensation in the form of a fringe benefit in terms of cash. As a fringe benefit, you got to drive around in a Rolls Royces cash. You didn't keep any of it. So um, tax fairness is a problem. Now, simplicity. Um, it's <laughs> estimated in the United States that the complexity of the code cost in the order of $500 billion. Now, out of a $15 trillion economy, it's not trivial. So what we have are tax lawyers, tax accountants, tax preparers, time and effort going into pay tax, um, avoiding tax, cheating outright, evading tax, and uh, a lot of smart people who help you do this. So we basically take a half a million of the smartest people in the whole world, and they don't add any value to an economy. All they do is spend all their time reducing the taxes of ultra-rich people. So in Silicon Valley, the tax planning chapter has about 400 people. And they all said that if they had a 20% flat tax, they'd all be out of business. But because we have taxes that can run up to 55% in California, they all do a very healthy business. And you will bump into a tax planner or a tax lawyer or a tax accountant anytime you see a kid in blue jeans who's worth $100 million because they're trying to keep this kid from having all his money disappear to the tax man. Now, a third thing we look at is efficiency. Avoid distortions, uh, avoid favoring one industry over another, uh, preferring uh, debt over equity, uh, and so forth. And the flat tax solves that problem. There's absolutely no discrimination in it against one industry or another, one company or another, one person against another. It's completely neutral with respect to all forms of activity and all forms of economic organization. Um, and then the purpose of taxation. Well, there's two purposes. One is good, one isn't. One purpose is to collect money to finance the vital needs of the state. And the other is to achieve social policy goals. So we want you to invest in low-cost housing, you'll get a preference for that. We want you to put up a, a theater somewhere, we'll give you a preference for that. Um, we want you to uh, build a communal hall somewhere, we'll give you a preference for that. Um, and what happens, of course, you wake up one morning and you've got thousands and thousands of preferences. The whole thing is a mess. Nobody knows what owes what. And instead of having an economy that's been driven by um, economic efficiency and growth and then you spend the money, you have an economy that's distorted by preferences and favors and all kinds of, uh, of activities. So what I want to do is I want to go to the next slide and I'm going to talk about, thanks to Thomas Piketty, Piketty, you all heard of Piketty and um, the Frenchman who is no longer um, all that happy because he's been criticized now by dozens and dozens of economists. Um, at first his book overwhelmed everybody and pretty soon he's going to wish he hadn't published it with all the errors that have now been found in his estimates and his calculations and his methodology. So I'm going to call this the fairness bogeyman. And what I'm going to do um, over the next batch of slides is I want to show you in the 180 countries that have personal income tax rates, there's 180 different systems. Now, when you want to have a fair income tax, I want you to tell me which of those 180 is most fair unless you want to say they're fair for Africa or fair for Europe or fair for some other part of the world. And then once you tell me which one's that fair, why won't it stay still? Why is it changed every week? Every Monday and Thursday there's a new tax code. Not only do they differ, we can't find out which one we like the most so we change it every week. So the definition of fairness is whatever that week's flavor is. And next year it's that year's flavor. So um, I'm going to do all these comparisons. I'm going to show you changing rates over time. And then I'm going to show you there is absolutely no empirical basis for being able to say one system's fair and one's not. So here's the fun part of this. And this is going to be, um, uh, not if it's Tuesday, it's Belgium, but you're going to have to do like 30 countries every 30 seconds here. 
because we're this is a, a, this is going to be a world tour. So let's start out here: countries with no personal income tax. So if you look at all these, um, one of the things that's very interesting about this slide and the next is quickly count the number of current British jurisdictions and the number of former British colonies that are now independent. So if we go down here, we've got Bahamas, Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, St. Kitts and Nevis, Turk and Caicos Islands. That's fascinating. Somehow or other, the British still run a brilliant colonial system in which the taxes are zero on income. And so we call these tax havens. Now what do we have to do? We have to squash them like flies, squeeze them out, because why? They're draining money from France and Germany and Italy, and they're threatening the welfare state. So we can't have that. If we're going to have a big government with big spending, we've got to shut these things down. And so that's a major effort. Now, what I want to do here is I want to go to my favorite page in the whole world. Okay? This is, believe it or not, the flat tax world. Now, maybe you people never heard about the flat tax, but look at all the countries in the world that have one. And once again, if you go down here and take a look at, say, Anguilla and Belize um, and uh, Grenada and Guernsey, Guyana was, Hong Kong, Jamaica, Jersey, uh, let's see if I find a few more, Mauritius and St. Helena and the Seychelles. Um, at Trinidad and Tobago. It's amazing how successful what's left of the empire and many of the Commonwealth countries have for the flat tax. Just to show you how wonderful this is, the most recent country to adopt the flat tax is the Falkland Islands. The Falkland Islands are building a world-class runway, which is going to be able to handle Jumbo jets. And this is going to be wonderful for trade and traffic between Latin America, Europe, and Africa. And in order to create this whole entrepot center, they've just adopted 25% flat tax. And there's no double taxation of dividends, interest, or capital gains. And they're going to be encouraging businesses to set up operations. Now, my suggestion would be that Parliament should send a delegation down to the Falkland Islands and try to figure out what they're doing. Alternatively, Pick any of these others. Now, one of the things that I've done, of course, is I've put the rate in there. And remember, every one of these has a large personal allowance, so they're all progressive. Don't confuse progressive with multiple rates. Progressive with an exemption is a progressive system, as I'll show you a moment in a slide. But as you see here, this is not one or two cases. Now, two of these, unfortunately, have temporarily adopted a surcharge but that's only to last for three years. But there has been an ongoing effort by the uh, socialist crowd at the International Monetary Fund and other international organizations to pressure these countries to abandon their flat taxes. And so far, they've successfully resisted. And they've resisted because they work, because the underground economies have come above ground and because revenues have increased and they've been very successful. Now. Um, I want to begin here, since I know we have a whole flood of Russians in the place. This shows you what happened when Russia adopted its flat tax of 13%. They had previously had three rates of 12, 22, and 30. And so you can't cut that rate from 30 down all the way to 13. You can't cut that rate from 22 all the way to 13. The country will lose money. But look what happened. This is an inflation-adjusted revenue, and this is compounding. So it's not total. So you take 125% and then add it by 24, and then add that together and compound it and add that. This is a tripling of revenue in real inflation-adjusted terms over a period of six years. The flat tax didn't cost money to the Treasury. It increased it dramatically. It put a stop to the culture of tax evasion and tax cheating. It got people used to paying income taxes. It was an incredible success by any stretch of the imagination. So I put these numbers up, and I had some Russian graduate students help me go into the data and calculate this every year. By the way, the basic Russian tax can be filed online on a one-page sheet of paper. So those of you who know Russian, you can actually look and see how this thing works in practice. 
Okay, now, this is in my office. This is a table in my office, and this is a flag of every flat tax country that has adopted it. And um, I can't remember half of them. Um, I know the first half, but I've lost track of them because they grew so rapidly. And um, so as you can uh, see here, there's um, a bunch of interesting ones with uh, the Union Jack on it. Uh, that may be Tuvalu, and um, I don't remember all of them, but there's another British one in there. And so there's a nice fair sprinkling of, of Union Jacks there. So the nice thing, my hope would be, is to take the blue color away and have the Union Jack fill the whole flag up. And then we'd have a nice simple 20 pence on the pound where you would make whatever you made. And it didn't matter whether it was 100, 1,000, a million, or 10 billion um, thing. So look at this. This is a really nice way to show what happened. Um, what brings about the flat tax? Well, in Central and Eastern Europe, when the Soviet Union crashed and all these countries went from communist command and control systems to uh, market economies, you had to go from the state allocating credit and collecting it to markets and taxes. So a lot of them adopted the flat tax because you needed something clean and simple. And the flat tax can be done on a, pay, on a postcard, on a piece of paper, maybe two pages at the most. And you could set it up almost overnight and you could do it digitally. So in Estonia, there's no paperwork anywhere. It's all done online. And now increasingly in most of the flat tax countries, it's done online. And budget discussions are online. There's no pieces of paper floating around the system anymore. So that really makes life easy. Now, um, let me go on here because uh, I want to show you the complexity of life. These are countries of jurisdictions that have two rates. Now, what's important about here is that in a lot of them, the rates are relatively low. So Antigua and Barbuda, it's only 25%. Isle of Man is only 20%. Um, Marshall Islands are only 12%. Um, do we have any more British sites here? No. But anyway, what you can see is if you add all those up, you begin to see. Now we're going to go to the rest of the world here. And I'm not going to ask you to memorize these pages or anything. I'm just going to try to show you the complexity of tax rates. And remember, I asked you at the very beginning, find the most fair among them all. Mirror, mirror on the wall, which is the fairest income tax system of them all. And it keeps going on and on and on and on and on. And, uh, you know, keeps on going here. And I separated it by uh, country and we're still going here. Okay. So uh, last page. Okay. Well, I think I've made my point here. And my point was, is that there's 180 countries with income taxes and there's 180 different income tax systems. And so the ones with zero rates are pretty good, but you have other kinds of revenue like value added tax or oil revenue or uh, custom duties. And then the one rates with income taxes make a lot of sense everywhere. But all of these others are unnecessarily complex, hard to administer, and oh, by the way, in Africa, for some reason, most of them have four, five, or six rates and they can't collect any money at all. And they all like to have 30, 40, and 45% rates because that's what the Nordic economies and the welfare states of Europe have. And they can't collect any money at all either. So um, it goes hand in hand that in Africa, there's no money coming in to run these countries. So they all have their hands out for money from elsewhere. And um, let's run ourselves up here into uh, Britain. Um, the history of British taxes, I got involved with British taxes uh, about 25 years ago. I wrote a book on 19th century British taxation. And so if you look a little bit of British taxation after the Napoleonic War, what you can see here is that for um, the war itself, the rate never got higher than 10%. They fought the Napoleonic Wars with a tax rate of 10%. And they thoroughly trounced the French. I mean, it wasn't a matter of a mild victory. It was a complete and total defeat. And um, Napoleon spent the rest of his life with a big turtle out on St. Helena, which is another British territory with low taxes. <laughs> so he got the benefit of that anyway, but uh, he wasn't in a position to earn any real money here. And then as you see, look at the rates. Um, of course, World War I had shot up to 30%. Um, but what's really interesting is the rates after World War I were much higher than they were during World War I. Or for those of you who've seen uh, one of my favorite movies, A Few Good Men, can you explain that, Colonel Jessup? Why the rates in peacetime were higher than they were during wartime? That's not supposed to be. 
Then, of course, uh, World War II came and the rates really shot up. And uh, so now we're going to go back here and we'll take a look at the rates since the end of World War 99.25%. Wow, you got to keep 75 pence on 100 pounds. That's a stunning amount of money. Um, if you were in the upper income. But you can see, so what I've done here is um, I've given you what was called, very, they call these things various things, the employment income, top rate, the investment income, BR is basic rate. And what you can see is how these rates have gone up and down, up and down, up and down with the basic rate. And then you can see the top rates added on there. So they had a 40% rate, then a 50, then a 45. But So for those of you who are having to deal with people, and you do have an election coming up, and you will have oh, three, four, five, six parties come and tell you, we need a fair tax system, right? We want a fair, now I, I, I want all of you en masse to be everywhere, every time one of the politicians goes, please tell us what a fair tax system is. Please tell us why it wasn't fair before. Please tell us why it won't be fair later. And please tell us which of the hundred systems you think is fair. And then give us a serious economic and philosophical justification that can stand the test of time. So let's go to the US. And um, I run this up only by decade just to show you what the lowest rate and the top rate was. Now, the one thing I want to tell you about 1920 is that 74% rate applied to maybe one tenth of 1% of the population. So it wasn't an effective rate on a significant part of the economy. It had um, a very small rate. And then you can see by 1930, it was cut back to uh, 25%. The war ratcheted up, and you can see how it stayed high. But during the period it was 20 to 90%, the Eisenhower years, 88% of the population paid the 20% rate. So we had an effective flat rate for not, almost 90% of the population. But then we had what's called inflation and bracket creep. And everybody kept pushing up into higher brackets because we didn't adjust the brackets for inflation. So people who used to be in the 20% were then in the 35% bracket. And one of the things that led to uh, Ronald Reagan's victory was the disastrous inflation under Jimmy Carter in which everybody was pushed into higher brackets. When you adjusted inflation, your income was the same, but you had less because you paid higher taxes. So that was not a very successful economic policy. Now. I've done a very brief and very short here. Let's get to this. Here we are. Okay. All I did was run for you the tax rates. Now, in every economy, in every tax system, one or more of these other factors varies. And they vary over time. So if you take these variables, it basically runs to something like 25 factorial. If there's any of you people in the room who are mathematicians, we're talking tens of thousands of varieties of income tax systems. Because you can adjust the capital gains, and you can adjust the income gains, and you can adjust the royalty rate, and the interest rate, and the inheritance rate, and the fringe benefit rate, and so forth. All of these things vary within each country in addition to the rates. I just wanted to make the point about rates to show you that there's no uniform global standard for social justice, no national standard for social justice that can be found in the history of any country or crossing countries. It doesn't exist. It's a concept that gets votes but doesn't effectively deal with the consequences of income tax policies. Okay, we're coming along here and now the number of pages in the federal tax rules. Look at this. We started with 400 pages. We're now at something like 75,000 pages. Um, what's interesting about the chart? It never goes down, ever. Every time a tax rule is put in place, an old one isn't taken away. You know the notion of sunset provisions introduce a new law, the old law expires? Doesn't exist. It's hot air. This is just stunning number. And think about this. They've done a number of tests in the United States. If you take your income tax to 10 different accountants, you get 10 different returns. If you call the Internal Revenue Service with a helpline, they begin by telling you, 
We are not responsible for anything we tell you. If your tax form is challenged, you're responsible for paying any back taxes and interests. We're only trying to help, but we have no legal standing that you can rely on, uh, i.e., they don't understand the tax system either. Now, um, this is one of my favorite photos because this is the man who started it all, Mark Lahr. 32 years of age, read Milton Capitalism and Freedom, had a look at our flat tax book. Soviet Empire came down and he said, you know what, let's not fiddle around. So went to a simple flat tax and then they sold off all the state-owned enterprises. <laughs> they got rid of import barriers. They deregulated the economy and um, did it all in one swoop. Um, and um, Estonia for years after years after years ran budget surpluses, no debts. And they couldn't spend the surpluses because if you're going to build a hospital, you need doctors and nurses. And if you're going to build a university, you need teachers and faculty. So they really had to spend the money only in keeping with their ability to train personnel fast enough. Now, regrettably, he passed away a few years ago from cancer, which is um, a tragic case. But he did this at the ripe young age of 32. Um, and I guess he was told by all kinds of people, this can't work. But uh, his excuse is he didn't know any better, so why not give it a try? And um, I want to also mention to you that today, I think Estonia has the best tax system in the world. They have abolished the corporate income tax. It doesn't exist. All corporate income is paid out and is taxed at the same 21% rate in the hands of individuals, in which individuals are taxed on their personal income. And anything retained that's reinvested is free of tax. So from a business standpoint, it passes off its profits to the individual shareholders, and it uses the retained earnings to expand. And all you have then, in effect, is a personal income tax system of 21% with no double taxation of dividends, no double taxation of capital, all at 21%. The only thing wrong is it's a percentage point too high, but they started at 26, they went to 24, 22, 21, and uh, they don't have any public debt to speak of. So um, it works pretty good. And um, in the whole OECD, it has the most competitive system of all from a purely business and individual standpoint. Now, um, there's a little bonus in here. This won't stay green. OK, uh, the book is free online. The best way is to um, just Google my name, make sure you spell Rabushka right. Um, up will come is my bio page, and on my bio page in the big paragraph, you'll see the words the flat tax underlined. Click it on, and then you can download and print each chapter. You're welcome to print as many copies as you like. And it also exists in French, German, Spanish, Italian, and Slovakian. Um, and we're working on other languages as well. But, uh, and those are all free too, but you don't order them through here. You, I'll leave it to you to search for them, or afterwards I can tell you how to, how to get them. So anyway, um, that's your bonus for tonight. Oh, oh, sorry, let me back up here. OK, now I wanted to make the point. Um, Bob Hall and I decided when we did this project that we would rewrite the US tax code. Um, it takes four pages to do that. In the back of our book, we wrote the flat tax law. It's four pages long. Um, now, how can we do this? Well, because business and personal income are taxed at the same rate, that makes it easy. There's no interest in the tax code. It's neither deductible nor is it uh, taxable. So you don't have to deal with interest in the tax code. Um, you can either treat retirement pre or post tax, makes no difference. Um, we hit, treated it here pre tax and deducted it. There's another form, too, for business that's shorter. Uh, it only has 12 lines on it instead of 13 here. But um, this was enough to replace the entire U.S. tax code, which now has well over 500 forms and 70,000 pages of instructions. It's self enforcing um, and uh, it doesn't give rise to cheating because the rate is so low. Um, the way we've set it up is 100% write off of all investment spending in the first year, fully integrated, so no double taxation of dividends and capital gains, and no interest in the system. And then with a personal allowance, it's graduated and progressive. And this is a very important point, and maybe this is one of the most important points. Let me get to the page. Now, it has been said a flat tax is regressive, it hurts the poor, it's terrible, it's painful. I want you to look at this and pay attention. 
The personal allowance is unchanged to $20,000 for a taxpayer. We run the income from $20,000 up in chunks to a million. We subtract the personal allowance, we get the taxable income. We then take 20% of the taxable income at every stage above that. We then get the tax paid, and you can see that the effective tax rate goes from zero up to 19.6. So by the time you get to $10 million, it's 19.9999. But the point is, progressive means the higher your income, the greater share of your income you pay. Progressive does not mean you have to pay at increasingly higher rates of 20, 40, 45, 52, 75, 130. A flat rate with a personal allowance is a progressive income tax. Now, this is the hardest point to convince people of, but a chart like this, and you can do it in pounds if you want, or you can do any income brackets any way you want, but the point is you can design this to be as progressive as you want. If you want to be more progressive, increase the personal allowance to 30,000 or increase it to 35,000. Not so high as to have most of the people not paying tax because then 51% will vote to tax all of the other 49%. But you can see this point and it really has to be remembered. Otherwise, you're going to forget and make this confused distinction between graduated rates and progressivity. Now I have to go backwards here, or one. Okay, so the feature of our tax, which is pretty much in place in most. Now, there's many ways the flat tax are done. This was what we call the ideal standard type. It's the baseline on which people will vary whether you want to have a charitable contribution or not, or in the United States, the sacred cow of home mortgage interest deduction or not. But my views are that you should minimize these because once you have five, um, you will discover that the 395 other lobbies each believe that a special benefit for beekeepers is certainly as important as a charitable contribution or retirement account. And trust me, there are organizations that can make that point convincingly. So um, here are the features, personal exemption, low rates, and look at all the benefits you get out of low rates here. You, get, you encourage risk taking, reduce corruption, reduce pressure. Um, my one movie career consisted of a 28-minute film on Hong Kong called uh, A Story of Human Freedom and Progress done in 1980. So there I am interviewing the financial secretary, and I'm saying, why do you practice a system of low rates of 15%? And he said, we believe 15% low rate encourages risk taking and unleashes human energy. Pretty profound comment. Then they once asked C. Nothcart Parkinson of Parkinson's Law, who lived on Jersey, where they have a 20% flat tax, why don't you reduce it to 15? And you know what he said? He said at 15, it'll generate more revenue and the government will spend its money on silly things. So 20 is just about right. <laughs> so um, these things are kind of just interesting commentaries and they're all British or former British jurisdictions. It's stunning to me that the country in the world with the greatest amount of entities linked to it with flat or low taxes has a home country that can't seem to see the forest for the trees. Anyway, um, let's click on here. Um, so uh, and none of the other features, and again, this is just the features of our particular flat tax, but it's pro-investment, and uh, it balances out uh, debt versus equity. Um, it balances out across all industries, all benefits, as you can see. Um, it's transparent, it's easy to comply with. Now, there's one other thing that's important, and I found this really to be crucial. There's a difference between life in a 20% world and life in a 50% world. And what happens is that people who live in the 50% world, which are the political classes, think differently about taxes. People who live in a 15 or 20% world think entirely different. So for example, take the 50% world. If you hide a dollar of income, you cheat. It's worth $2 of pre-tax income. It pays you to cheat. Or if business expenses are deductible, let's go have what we used to call the three martini lunch, because that's a business expense. It doesn't cost you a dollar to have lunch. It only costs you 50 cents. But now drop the rate to 20%. Well, I'm not gonna go to lunch to save 20 cents. It's not worth it. I'd rather keep the 80 cents as a return on business activity. So you change the risk and reward, and at 20%, I'm not gonna go to jail. At 50%, I might do it or I'll ship it off to the Bahamas, or I'll find somewhere else to place it. And when that rate gets low enough, 
all of a sudden, you no longer approach, you come into the uh, uh, CEO's office on his right hand is the tax man, on his left is business planner, and you fire the guy on the right hand because you don't have to worry about the tax consequences. I've reduced the flat tax to seven words. Remove the tax code from the economy. Once it's set at that nice low level, business just is made on the basis of business decisions, not on the basis of tax considerations. We don't form the tax man, we form the economy. Okay, and look at this. This is what the compliance costs are. If the flat tax, you can see the billions of dollars it costs versus the current system. So the estimate is how much money you would save in 1996, 150 odd billion, that's now tripled. In other words, that money goes into real productive activity as opposed to subtracting from real productive activity because you're basically taking a half a million smart people and you're getting them to do accounting tricks. Okay, so why is everybody opposed to it? Beats the hell out of me, but anyway, there's a lot of opposition out there. Well, voters have different values. Um, anyone who promises to rob Peter to pay Paul can usually count on Paul's support. So there's a lot of Pauls out there and a lot of politicians who are appealing to Paul. Secondly is this ideological obsession with soaking the rich. Um, now, the only thing I can figure out is the rich don't bathe and everyone else does because if the rich are filthy, they have to keep soaking them. We have what are the filthy rich and so we soak the rich and that's kind of how this whole metaphor put them in the bathtub and when they come out they don't have any money because we've taken it from them. So um, we have to soak the rich and what's social justice? Well, as I've told you, I have no idea what it is, neither does anybody else, but it's such a wonderfully amorphous concept that nobody can refute it. My view is more socially just than yours. My tax system is more uh, socially just than yours. What I do with the environment is more socially just than yours. I walk, I don't drive, I'm socially just. We could go on and spend a whole seminar for a semester trying to define social justice. And basically what it boils down to is uh, your opinion because there is no scientific sound basis other than what you can uh, assert and uh, succeed in by either political activity or regulatory activity or social activity or whatever else. And then of course there's the special interests that arise. One of the beauties of being in a parliament or a congress is you can give favors and you get tax contributions back to run for office again. And all those things narrow the tax base and you uh, encrust it like a Rube Goldberg machine. So we have 70,000 lobbyists in Washington to lobby 535 members of Congress, the executive branch, and the agencies. So there's about 20 lawyers for every legislator. Um, and if you look at their daily calendar, about a third of it is made up of donors, a third of it is made up of lobbyists, and uh, the other third is conducting the public's business, which is last on the list. Um, and then, here we are. We finally come to the end. I probably overrun my time. So, the only real solution for me is the flat tax. It's fair, simple, and transparent. And um, for any of you who came in as doubting Thomases, I hope you doubt no more. So at this point, I think we go to questions, and I'm going to let you yep. pick and choose the questions. Thank you very much.